Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight we have two hours of horror stories as per usual. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated. I do read all of my comments as well if you would like to drop one. I hope you all enjoy this video. Um, story 1 has a topic in it that I know most of you like quite a bit. I can't say what it is without spoiling it. Yeah, this whole entire video has some really, really solid stories in it. Sit back, do whatever it is that you do to relax, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I work at a radio station. Yeah, I guess it's one of those jobs that will eventually come to an end sooner or later. If you are a bit younger, imagine a live podcast without video and with music. That's more or less it. My name is Marcus and I'm 25 years old. When I was a child, although already declining, there were still many radios around and I used to listen to them at night when I didn't want to sleep and couldn't turn on the TV. That's where my dream of working here came from, and well, I guess I made it. I work at Waves FM. Fictitious name, obviously. I wouldn't want to expose more than necessary during the night shift. And I simply love it. The whole atmosphere, me with my headphones listening and talking to people, playing requested songs and sometimes discovering the value they have for each individual. It's magical. One night, as usual, I arrived at the studio ready for another broadcast. It should have been around 10 p.m., half an hour before my entry. However, upon entering my room, something strange immediately caught my attention. On the desk, in addition to the usual letters and bills to pay, there was an audio tape with a single symbol X recorded on it. I confess I found it curious, but with time running short, I decided to set it aside to listen to it later. After all, I needed to do my vocal exercises and prepare the microphone and other things. As the night progressed and the music filled the air, the break time arrived. I took the opportunity to interact with the listeners, attending to their requests and messages. That's when an elderly gentleman called in requesting the song Eyes Without a Face. Believe me, one of the most requested songs on our station. I promptly played it, but little did I know what Billy Idol would be just the introduction to something much stranger. Well, that was Eyes Without a Face, as requested by our buddy Mr. Grimshaw. Stay tuned in to Waves FM for more nostalgia. And now let's see who will request the next hit. I pressed the button on the desk. Hello? An uncomfortable silence ensued. Someone was on the line. The panel displayed it, but no one spoke. One of the rules of radio is precisely not to leave these gaps. If our only content is audio, we must fill it well. Can you hear me, my dear? How about playing the tape I sent you? I looked at the desk with the X tape. Ah, very well, folks. Earlier today I received a mysterious tape, and it seems that now we have the sender here making their request. Very well, my friend. Let's see what you have for us. I put the tape in the machine and pressed play. A few moments after the reel started spinning, what followed was a cacophony of agonizing screams that invaded my ears. I felt a small shock run down my spine and, instinctively, ripped off the headphones, futilely muffling them. I returned as soon as I regained my senses, stopping the tape. Sorry, folks. It seems we have a troll here. Quite funny, huh, buddy? I'm dying laughing. I played another random song, trying to lighten the mood a bit while calming the pounding in my chest. I grabbed the tape and threw it in the trash. I had had other pranks before. Or things like, do you know Joe? Or is it true you're sick with Ligma? But nothing on this level. The night continued its course. 
with me trying to leave behind the bitter taste left by the tape. I interacted with a few more listeners and played more songs according to their requests. For a while, I managed to distract myself from that disturbing event. I bid them farewell as the first rays of sunlight appeared on the distant horizon. It was a turbulent night, folks, but we made it through. Stay safe and see you the next time here on Waves FM. I got up from the chair to see the station manager, Rob, enter through the door. He's a man in his 60s, but definitely strong and quite independent for his age. He was a radio enthusiast who had bought the station with a lot of effort, going to work there every morning. We didn't really have a boss-employee relationship. He was truly a good friend, more like a grandfather or uncle, you know. Hey there, kid. He said. Good night? Hello, Rob. I replied trying to sound as relaxed as possible. Yeah, it was a busy night. Lots of requests. Lots of good music playing. Rob nodded as he approached the control desk. His eyes scanned the studio, noticing the X tape lying in the trash can. A slight furrow of his eyebrows betrayed his curiosity. What's this? He pointed to the tape. Oh, that? I feigned interest, though my pulse quickened slightly. Just a tasteless prank from a listener. A tape with some strange sounds. Nothing serious, just tossed it away. Rob nodded, but his expression indicated something was bothering him. Make sure not to lose focus because of these things, Marcus. Sure, Rob. You got it. I assured him. He gave my shoulder a pat before stepping away. Good job tonight. Rest well. You deserve it. With a forced smile, I thanked him and watched as he left the studio. Once the door closed behind him, a shiver ran down my spine. I shook my head to dispel the dark thoughts. I was probably just paranoid because of the strange tape. I resolved to leave it behind and focus on finishing my shift. I got home and collapsed into bed, but as soon as I closed my eyes, I plunged into some restless dreams, the screams echoing again. I woke up a few hours later, a bit sore, heading out of the house to get some fresh air. I stopped at the small convenience store at the gas station across the street from my house, ordered a black coffee and scrambled eggs, my breakfast. I was trying to perk myself up with the meal chatting about the weather with the waiter. I spent the rest of the afternoon there, talking, watching pedestrians, and praying that night wouldn't come. But soon enough, the shadows began to creep in, and the sun hid behind the hills. Back in my apartment, I opened the door to feel my foot brushing against something. A dry sound. I looked down to see a small letter, my name written on it. When I opened it, however, my heart started pounding. My mind was confused and racing, and I felt sick. In bold letters, the phrase was displayed, Do not throw away my tapes. A shiver ran down my spine as my brain tried to process the meaning of those words. Who was behind this nonsense? Did they know where I lived? The town is small, not impossible. Maybe it's a prank of very poor taste. I grabbed my phone and dialed Rob's number. He picked up after a few rings. Hey Rob, sorry to bother you, but I need to talk to you about something strange that happened last night. Rob listened in silence as I recounted the events from the previous night, from discovering the X tape to today's warning. Hmm, he muttered after I finished. That's concerning. Maybe it's best for you to come to the station. I agreed with Rob's suggestion and hung up the phone. Putting on a jacket, I grabbed my motorcycle keys and headed to the radio station. Upon arriving, I found Rob waiting for me in the reception area. He had a serious look on his face as we greeted each other and proceeded to the studio together. We sat in front of the computer and began reviewing the recordings from the previous night. During one of the breaks, when I played the X-tape, Rob stopped me. 
kid, did you listen to the whole tape? Rob asked, leaning forward. I swallowed hard, recalling the moment when the screams invaded my ears. No, Rob. I only listened for a few seconds before turning it off. It was a sudden loud noise and it startled me. Rob nodded, looking pensive. Good. Don't listen to that tape ever again, okay? He retrieved it from the trash can and broke it. And any others like it, preferably. Don't even answer restricted calls. The wrinkles on Rob's face seemed to multiply as he spoke, and I understood that the situation was more serious than I had imagined. I nodded, agreeing with his instruction. Got it. I replied, feeling a lump form in my throat. But what do you think is going on? Rob sighed, looking concerned. Marcus, that's all you need to know and can know. He glanced away and stood up. Try to relax, alright? Just stay away from this and you'll be fine. Are you going to stay around here? The feeling of unease only grew within me as I watched Rob gather the pieces of the tape and put them into an envelope. He placed the envelope in a locked drawer and looked at me with seriousness. Yeah, I think I'll stick around for a little while longer. Maybe go over some things for the next shift. I replied, trying to sound calm. Thank you, Rob. You know, for giving me the heads up. Rob nodded, placing his hand on my shoulder with a reassuring gesture. Anything, don't hesitate to call. I nodded, watching him leave the studio as my mind swirled with questions and concerns. And I decided that I needed answers. Maybe it was curiosity. Maybe it was fear of the unknown. But I just couldn't ignore it. Carefully, I waited until I was alone in the station and approached the drawer where Rob had stored the remnants of the X tape. With some effort, I managed to open the drawer and retrieve the envelope. My heart pounded in my chest as I opened it, revealing the fragmented pieces of the tape. I held on the reels as I gently pulled out the plastic strip from inside, making sure not to scratch it and was about to do the same for the second one when someone knocked on the front door. It was a light knock, but firm enough to make me freeze in place. My heart raced as I tried to process what to do next. If Rob catches me doing this, I'm done, I thought. With a heavy sigh, I put the pieces of the tape back in the envelope and stored it in the drawer, closing it carefully. I took a deep breath, trying to calm my nerves as I headed to the station door to answer the knock. However, as I reached the beginning of the hallway, looking at the door at the end of it, something started sliding through the mail slot. Something black, rectangular, falling with a hard sound. A tape. I hurried and opened the door abruptly, but all I saw was the night wind greeting me, and the nighttime view of the stars. The station was set away from the town, usually to avoid causing too much interference, so we had a dense forest of pine trees in front of our front door. The sight of them in the dark, however, was unsettling, and I quickly closed the door. I looked at the tape on the floor in front of me, this time displaying the letter D. I picked it up, curious and confused, giving it a thorough examination. It looked identical to the other one, except for the letter. Surely they came from the same place, and considering the audio from the last one, I wasn't at all inclined to listen to this one. I stored it with the fragments of X and went into the booth to start the program, trying to push the feeling of unease from my mind. As the broadcast continued, I received messages and requests from listeners, recognizing the voices of some engaging in conversation, and gradually pulling myself out of that eerie trance. However, one particular request caught my attention. A soft voice, one I had never heard before, requested the playback of a song not very well known to our audience. Can you play The March of the Condemned? The voice asked, its tone sending shivers down my spine. That song. It wasn't part of our usual playlist. 
It was strange that someone knew it, let alone requested it to be played on a radio station. I tried to push away these thoughts, focusing on fulfilling the listener's request as best as I could. However, as soon as the music began to play, a feeling of discomfort settled in the booth. The chords echoed through the speakers, filling the studio with a heavy atmosphere. I tried to adjust the volume a bit, which by now seemed too loud. I realized something was wrong, the controls seemed to no longer respond. I persisted, clicking harder, repeatedly, but to no avail. I tried to stop the broadcast to announce technical difficulties with no response. I even tried to shut down the system, but it was in vain. I was out of control of the station. That's when I heard it. Above the music, above the hum of the equipment, above even the frenetic beating of my heart, I heard a sound. A distant but unmistakable sound. It was the same agonizing screams that had invaded my ears when I played the X tape. They were low at first, but now they were rivaling the music. A terrifying combination of the two intertwining melodies. It was starting to make my head itch. When I realized it wasn't coming from the speakers, but from the D tape now resting on the table spinning. Now my brain could at least understand. A primitive panic took over me, the kind of thing that scares you without even realizing why, you know? It was as if your whole being feels threatened by it. It didn't make sense to be afraid of the tape, even if it was of screams and strange sounds, but that... With trembling hands, I lifted the plastic cover and looked at the tape, seeing the letter D shining in the dim light of the booth. In a desperate impulse, I ripped it from the machine, but the screams didn't stop. They seemed to be echoing from everywhere and becoming louder and more desperate now. All I did was throw it away. It collided with the wall, breaking in half and falling to the floor. With that, the music, now at its end, returning to normal, fading out. Eh, and that was the March of the Condemned, I said, still somewhat shaken. Let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere, because we've got more coming up on Waves FM. The relief I felt seeing the broken tape on the floor was momentary. My heart still pounded in my chest. My hands trembled and my whole body felt tense. I needed a moment to compose myself, to understand what was happening. But before I could do anything, I heard footsteps approaching the studio. My ears focused and I hid under the table. The door opened slowly. I could feel a presence there, standing at the entrance. Footsteps started coming in, entering the booth suddenly stopped. Marcus, I can see you back there. What's going on? Rob asked, his eyes fixed on the broken tape on the floor. Rob? I said, my voice faltering a bit with anxiety. Trembling, I emerged from behind the table. It's... I received another tape. Like the one from yesterday. Rob approached and looked at the broken tape, his eyes narrowing in concentration. What letter? He asked, his voice calm, still not averting his gaze from the pieces. What? What letter? On the tape. This time he raised his eyes to me. It was... It was a D. Why? A D? Dang it. Tell me you didn't play it. I... I didn't play it, but when I looked... It was there, spinning in the player. That's not good. That's not good at all. Rob seemed tense, his eyes scanning the wreckage of the tape on the floor as if searching for answers amid the chaos. Marcus, take the day off. Rob said, his voice laden with concern. I don't even want to think about you being near any audio equipment, okay? I nodded in agreement. My hand still trembled as I picked up the pieces of the broken tape from the floor, tossing them into the nearest trash can. 
A feeling of relief was palpable as I finally left the studio and distanced myself from the radio station. Rob drove me home in his car. Throughout the day, I tried to distract myself with anything that didn't involve sound. Books, crafts, but the image of the D tape spinning in the sound machine continued to haunt my thoughts. At night, as the sun began to set and darkness enveloped the night, the feeling of unease returned with full force. It was as if I were being watched. Maybe listened to was a better word. It was as if an ear rested against the wall, attentive to all my movements, like something lurking. I decided to return to the radio station, despite Rob's warnings. I didn't want to be held hostage by whatever this was. So I made my way back to Waves FM, my heart pounding in my chest as I approached the familiar building. When I entered the room, I found Rob still there, working on some papers behind the reception counter. He looked up when he saw me enter, an expression of surprise and concern crossing his face. Marcus, what are you doing here? He asked, his voice laden with concern. I told you to stay away, didn't I? I know, Rob, I know, I replied, trying to sound confident despite the tremor in my voice. But I've had enough. I just want to know what is going on with these tapes and everything else, and I think you know. My tone rose, firmer than usual. I thought Rob would retort and argue back, but instead he sighed, looking resigned. Okay, Marcus, he finally said. You want to know what's going on? I'll tell you. He set the papers aside. Sit down. Rob indicated a chair next to me, his face serious and concerned. I sat down, ready to listen. First of all, I want you to know that what I'm about to tell you is serious. Very serious. Rob began, his voice low and intense. Have you ever heard of the radio man? A shiver ran down my spine at the mention of that name. The Radio Man was a pretty common urban legend among radio hosts. You can ask anyone if you know. It's like an entity, a sinister thing, linked to late night radio broadcasts, sort of like a Bloody Mary. They usually use it to scare the newcomers who come in at night. I've done that myself a few times, but definitely not proud of it now. Yes, I've heard of him, I replied, my voice an involuntary whisper, but I always thought it was just a horror story to scare the newbies. Rob nodded slowly. I thought the same when I started. He paused for a moment, seeming to carefully choose his next words. A long time ago, right after I bought the station, there was a radio host who worked here at night. His name was Richard. He was a talented man, passionate about radio, and about the supernatural. Rob's gaze drifted, staring at an empty wall. We had a late night horror show on the radio. Stories, urban legends, listener reports, all kinds of stuff. But he wanted more. He cleared his throat. Incredibly, he managed to make contact with the radio man. I don't know how exactly. But from that moment on, things started to change. Richard became obsessed, continuing to communicate with this entity, even when things began to get strange and I warned him to stop. Rob sighed, his expression grim. Eventually, Richard disappeared. No one knows for sure what happened to him. Some say he was taken by the radio man. Others believe he went mad and ran away. But what is certain is that since then, I haven't allowed programs of that kind on our schedule. Wow, Rob. I didn't know. I'm not done yet, he interrupted standing up. Follow me. We walked to a small room in the back, a sort of basement that Rob nicknamed the boss's room, since only he had access to it. I entered the room behind Rob my mind still trying to process all this information. 
The room was dark and damp, lit only by the faint light of a bulb hanging from the ceiling. In the center of the room, there was an old dusty table covered in piles of yellow documents. Rob approached a rusty metal cabinet in the corner of the room and opened the door with a loud creak. Inside the cabinet, I saw a series of audio tapes, dusty with age. The labels displayed an individual letter each, just like the ones I received. Not all the letters were the same. Some were missing, but I could see, from what I remember, a B, an M, R, W, and a Z. What are these tapes? I asked, my eyes scanning over them. We started receiving them shortly after Richard's supposed contact with the radio man. At first, it was the Z-tape, an unknown song, a bit unsettling, with a vibe sort of like Tiny Tim, you know? Then a T, with the testimony of a serial killer, about how he killed one of his victims. It was stomach-churning. It seemed that the closer to the beginning of the alphabet the letter was, the worse its content would be. Until he got to the B tape. Rob closed the cabinet with a heavy sigh. The B tape was the last one we received. I didn't listen to it, and I don't intend to. But after it, Richard disappeared. Why didn't you ever tell me about this before? I asked, my voice barely rising above a whisper. Rob sighed, running a hand over his tired face. I didn't want to scare you, Marcus. I didn't want you to get involved in this. I thought that if we ignored it, it would eventually go away. And it did. We had several good years without any trouble. But it seems to have come back, and it's getting worse. The whole story felt like it was ripped from a nightmare. I could barely wrap my head around the idea that something like this was happening at the radio station where I had been working for years, and that I might be involved in it. What do we do now? Rob seemed pensive for a moment, looking at the dusty tapes in the cabinet. I'm not entirely sure, he admitted, his voice heavy with concern. But one thing's for sure, we can't ignore this. Ignoring it definitely didn't work. If only we could see how the tapes are being delivered. I... I hesitated, remembering the moment when a tape was delivered to the station's door. The other night, I saw a tape being dropped off at our door. Maybe we can install some security cameras around the building to see if we can catch whoever's doing this. Rob nodded, looking intrigued by the idea. That might work, I suppose. At least to see if someone is placing the tapes, or if they come out of nowhere. We decided to act immediately. We bought some security cameras and installed them around the station, ensuring that all areas were covered. We spent several sleepless nights keeping watch. We used some pre-recorded programs to keep things running smoothly, and boy was it exhausting. Finally on the third night, we managed to capture something. The R-tape was delivered by a hooded figure, barely illuminated by the dim streetlights. The individual was tall, skinny, moved in a weird way, very spidery. They slid the tape through the gap in the door and vanished into the darkness, as if they had never been there. Rob and I watched in silence, our hearts pounding in our chests as we observed the mysterious figure disappear into the trees. After the video ended, we stared at the screen for a moment, processing what we had just seen. The simple sight of the creature had the same strange effect as hearing the tapes. I felt dirty, burdened. So with this, can we send it to the police? I asked. And say what? That there's a guy dropping tapes at the radio station's door? I think not only is that not a crime, but it's expected. Rob shook his head, looking frustrated. The police won't be able to do much with this, even if they wanted to. He sighed, running a hand over his face. 
I guess all we can do is keep watch and try to find out more about these tapes. Maybe we can find some clue that will lead us to an answer. I agreed with Rob. If we were going to investigate this, it would have to be on our own. Go home and take a shower. He pinched his nose. You stink. I sniffed my armpit, and I'm not proud to say he had a point. I drove home, trying to leave the thoughts of what we had seen on the road. After a good, well-deserved shower, I threw myself under the sheets and fell asleep. My phone is always on silent, so I was surprised when I picked it up shortly after waking up, and as my vision adjusted to the screen's brightness, I could see the outline of, I'm not exaggerating, 26 missed calls from Rob. I immediately called him. After two rings, he picked up. Hello? Rob, what's going on? Did he come back? Silence. Rob? I could hear the sound of the radio station. Birds in the distance. Heavy breathing in the background. I don't know what came over me, but I ran like never before to get there. I burst through the door and ran into the room, and when I saw what was there, I was paralyzed. I couldn't even think about the danger it presented. I stammered, trembled, my mind almost convulsed as cold sweat pulsed down my temples. Rob was sitting, stunned, his eyes bulging. He was illuminated by the faint light from the ceiling, and I could see him making that silent gesture as he looked at me, with his index finger placed over his lips. Right in front of him, there lay a tape, a tape marked with the letter A. Rob, I... I began to walk towards him, but he closed the cabin door abruptly, turning the latch and shutting himself in. What's going on? I tried to open it. He seemed agonized, holding his mouth almost as if there were about to be vomit. But when his hands wavered, what came out of his mouth was not bile, but a torrent of words. I couldn't quite understand at first, but just two seconds later, I was affected. It was probably what was on the A tape. The words... The mere understanding of them was driving me insane. As quickly as it came, it stopped. I saw Rob grab his mouth. It makes my stomach turn just to remember. He stopped, grabbed his tongue, and stretched it over the counter, picking up a scalpel resting in the second drawer and began his ordeal. The blade pierced the muscular tissue accompanied by a red eruption. The elderly man's grunts echoed in a surreal manner, but that pain didn't stop him. He continued, descending and descending, until the scalpel met the cold wood of the table, now bathed in his blood, sweat, and tears. He stood up with the crimson waterfall flowing from his mouth. While I stared at his tongue, which lay gently beside the tape. Oh my god! I rushed to him, trying in some way to help contain the bleeding. What are you doing? I was in shock, unable to comprehend the scene before me. Rob tried to articulate something, but his mouth was full of blood and he seemed unable to speak. His eyes, however, conveyed an almost inhuman desperation. I grabbed my phone and dialed the emergency number, but as the operator said that help was already on the way, I saw Rob with his finger and using his own blood as ink right on the table. Go and don't come back. He pleaded this amidst incomprehensible murmurs. The teams arrived shortly afterward, and I was stunned by the adrenaline and tried stumbling to explain the situation. They seemed to understand, and I know I was cowardly. But I didn't accompany Rob to the hospital. I decided to follow his advice and leave everything behind. That was two days ago. Today, as I was getting ready to leave with my bags packed, I noticed something in my mailbox. I felt sweat down my back as I began to think about what it could be. 
As I approached and opened it, however, I found a sturdy envelope with an official seal that read, Summons to attend trial. Dear Marcus, by means of this document, you are formally summoned to attend the trial related to the case of Robert, who is currently hospitalized and unable to appear in person. The trial will take place in the district court of... on... at... in room. Your presence is required as a key witness in the case at hand, in order to provide testimony and relevant information for the ongoing investigation. It is of utmost importance that you attend punctually and be prepared to answer questions from the judge, lawyers, and other interested parties. In case of impossibility to attend on the designated date and time, we kindly request that you contact this court as soon as possible to arrange a new date for your testimony. Your cooperation is essential for the fair and effective progress of this legal process. We count on your presence and collaboration. Official. I stared at the paper. After a call to the hospital, I found out that Rob has been unconscious since he arrived at the hospital, and therefore I can only testify to what happened. Considering that the cameras only captured the two of us entering the building, I understand that I am the main suspect, which leaves me unable to leave town. I don't know if this has been widely reported, but I just received news that two of the police officers investigating the case were found dead in... well... I don't want to disgust you, but it definitely wasn't pretty. Apparently they were conducting forensic analysis on some objects found at the crime scene including a tape, as stated in the report. These are definitely dangerous times. I advise you not to take back roads, avoid passing near towns, and travel with the radio off. But if you decide to ignore this warning, don't forget to tune in to Waves FM every day from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. for the best late night programming. Hi, I'm Peter. I work as a customer support for a video game that you've almost certainly heard of, if you're here on Reddit. Let's call it Wizard Quest for safety's sake. There are different ways that customers can contact us, but I prefer responding to text chat, since if I'm honest I'm not very good on the phone. That's not to say that I'm great at text chat either, but let's not tear me all the way down just yet. There's a bunch of things customers might choose to contact us about, whether it's payment issues, they're locked out of their account, or problems in the game itself. Our bosses really don't like us helping with any of that last stuff, so it's pretty much always going to be a polite redirect there. The customer who started all of this off didn't seem to be after any of those things. Her character name was Rastanafly, and her ticket just said, hello. In my experience, those tickets are usually either completely pointless or hiding a complex tech issue that requires about five hours to solve. For anonymity purposes, I'll just use my name as C.S. Pete. C.S. Pete. Hello, this is C.S. Pete, contacting you in regard to the ticket you sent. What did you need assistance with? A stone fly. Hey you, I need a word. Well this already put my nose out of joint because I don't like having to repeat questions. I hate it when customers need you to coax answers out of them. So I left it a few seconds to see if she'd follow up with anything. When it became clear that she wasn't about to type anything else, I gave up and asked again. Good morning, what did you need a word about? Rastanafly. What's it about? Well, this didn't seem to be going well at all. Perhaps English wasn't her first language. I tried to figure out what I'd said that was unclear, but I was already behind on ticket count. We have a target number to close a day, and I am not good at thinking when stressed. After a few seconds of further silence, I gave it another try. 
CS Pete. It is about the ticket you sent. It just had the description, hello. I wanted to ask if you need help with something. Rustell on a fly. I think I left a book here yesterday. It might have got mixed up with the others, but mine wouldn't have had a sticker in it. I frowned. Was this a prank? Did she think this was the library she'd contacted? But that made no sense. I could see from the ticket info that she'd sent it from in-game while playing on a character. Not by email or on the online form. Which, congratulations to anyone who finds a way to send a ticket to us through that route. Well, either way, she'd sent a message and I could hardly ignore it, no matter how bizarre it was. I tried to think it over. There were certainly books in-game, but they were just items you use to teach your character spells, or readable items that explain lore, or had silly little stories in them. You could trade them to other players, or sell them to in-game vendors. But it wasn't a game where you could just drop the item on the floor for anyone to pick up. As for stickers, well, that was anyone's guess. Perhaps she was just using a translation that was missing the meaning. I decided to ignore the parts I didn't understand and gave it another shot. CS Pete. Is this an in-game item that you have lost? I can search for it if you have the name. Rastana Fly. I don't think so. All the ones I checked had one. CS Pete. What is the book called? Rastana Fly. Please, it's Losing My Sins. I've checked everywhere else. C.S. Pete. Okay, one second. I'll check the logs. I didn't recognize the name offhand, but that didn't mean much. While I used to play the game constantly, most of my friends had split off to their own lives or different games. And it wasn't so interesting for me anymore. I was out of touch with a lot of the new stuff these days. First things first. I was going to look at her character's inventories to see if she hadn't just stored it on the wrong one or maybe just deleted or sold it to a vendor. Before I could do anything though, her next message came through. Astana Fly. Tell you what, why don't we check in the back? Follow me. And then I saw she had gone offline. It bothered me that she hadn't waited even a second for me to do the checks I'd promised, and I was a little irked that she'd raced away so fast. Perhaps she'd disconnected, I figured that I should maybe give her the benefit of the doubt, instead of jumping to the worst conclusion. But then I actually thought about her message, and found myself distracted again as I wondered what she was talking about. Maybe she was just agreeing with my plan to look through the logs. Well, either way. I left her to whatever she was doing, and looked through her character inventories. Nothing. I was about to bring up the logs when I realized I should probably check on the item itself. Bringing up the fan database, which was far better than anything the company provided, I got no results for losing my sins. I tried a couple of other searches, and sins brought up a bundle of items and quite a few spells too, but no, losing my sins. Since Rastanafly didn't seem to be in a rush to come back, and I was in a rush to get numbers, I closed her ticket after writing a quick, bland response. I just advised her that I couldn't find the book she was talking about, and she'd need to provide some more info on what exactly had happened. That lunch, in the office canteen, my friend Toby spent most of the time telling me something about a debate that sounded more like an argument he'd had with a colleague over the best way to handle an irate customer. I wasn't really listening, but I made what I hoped were the correct noises in response while I focused on the dried out husk that the blackboard had called a chicken schnitzel. Hey, is something up? Toby asked towards the end of lunch. You seem off today. I hadn't really noticed it myself, and yet when he brought it up, I suddenly realized he was right. Listlessly, I poked at the crusty remains of the schnitzel. Nothing's wrong, but I feel weird. Like I had a bad dream and I can't remember what it was, but everything's reminding me about it. That seemed to make Toby quite cheerful. Oh, I had one of those. So this one time... 
And off he went again. Whatever happened in his dream, I missed it, but I couldn't stop wondering why I felt so unsettled. The next day was Saturday. I figured I'd pop over to the library to pick up a random comic or two. Since I was supposed to be saving up for a holiday, and I wasn't sure I was ready to commit to a long-term series. It wasn't very busy. Spread over two floors, it had an elderly, almost clinical vibe. There were no cheerful decorations up, no stands with pictures of cartoon characters, and outside of the books themselves, everything was either white or pale green. The librarian station was a circular desk in the middle of the lower floor, and most people could be found somewhere in the vicinity. I headed up to the top floor, which had the comics section and a small shelf with the few fantasy books this librarian permitted. He was a tall man with a short black beard, his broad build more the sort I'd have expected to encounter at the gym. While I didn't get the impression he liked the sort of books I was into, he was friendly enough whenever I needed help. The only windows in the library were way overhead, touching the distant ceiling. They were too high to look out across the town, but you did at least have a good view of the dismal grey clouds that almost always decorated the sky. Today was no different. The wind was whistling around the small library, and occasionally the windows jerked and shook. That was the only ambience that accompanied me as I idly drifted through the comics section. I felt like trying the first two volumes of a new series. Even I didn't want to get stuck in. The problem was that I kept finding volumes 1 and 3, with the second ones missing or checked out. While I was muttering some choice words on the fourth occasion this happened, the whistling winds faded away to be replaced by a conversation at the desk downstairs. Hey you, I heard a woman say. I need a word. What's it about? said the librarian. I think I left a book here yesterday. She tapped the desk. It might have got mixed up with the others, but mine wouldn't have a sticker in it. A shiver of recognition went through me. I hadn't picked up on it at first. I'd read these words before, not heard them out loud, but this was more than just familiar. I don't think so, said the librarian, his voice suddenly tense. All the ones I checked had one. I left the manga shelf and tried to subtly look down at the conversation taking place at the desk. It's extremely unlikely that I would have gone unnoticed had anyone else actually been down there, but aside from the woman speaker and the librarian, nobody was about. And these two were completely focused on each other. While I recognized the woman's words, I didn't know her. She had dusty blonde hair, looked to be in her late thirties, and wore a green turtleneck jumper that seemed a size too big. In contrast to her, the librarian's smart shirt was just a little too small, which had the effect of making him appear twice as tense. Seeing him standing like that, I had the sense that I probably didn't appear far different, frozen as I was up here. The dread I felt was overpowering, was it really that big of a deal? You read the conversation before it happened, I reminded myself. Of course it's a big deal. That's impossible. Forgetting any attempt at subtlety, I stared fixedly at the lady as I awaited her next words. Part of me dreaded hearing the name, as though it would close a door behind me forever. Please, she said. It's losing my sins. I've checked everywhere else. Well? It was like I was standing in the middle of a spotlight, the sound of trumpets blaring all around. I felt as if all eyes in the world were suddenly on me. Even though neither of the two below turned to look, I stumbled away from the rail and collided with the bookcase behind me. Apparently my little stumble went unnoticed, as the librarian responded to her a moment later. Tell you what. Why don't we check in the back? Follow me. I heard the sound of their footsteps, and a door opened and shut shortly after. Whatever had just happened, I felt like it had to be significant. Moving seemed like a disruption, and once again I had that sensation that there were eyes fixed on me. 
They can't see me if I don't move, right? I thought. It made as much sense as hiding under the covers, as though the monster under the bed would be turned away by such a feeble defense. Slowly, almost shaking, I approached the rail and looked down at the desk again. It was almost disappointing to see that nothing had changed. Feeling like I should hang about to see if anything else happened, I grabbed a random volume one and hurried downstairs. Nobody else was around. When had they all left, anyway? So I had my pick of chairs. Though I settled down in a chair, I was unsettled. My eyes couldn't focus on the meanings of the words in the comic. I turned page after page, simulating the act of reading. But if you'd asked me to repeat anything of what I'd just read, I wouldn't even be able to summarize it. What is wrong with me? Nothing happened. Why do you even care? But I was certain that conversation was exactly what Rastanafly had sent to me in the text chat yesterday. That wasn't possible, though. I had to be misremembering. Maybe I dozed off upstairs without realizing, and in my post-sleep state I'd started imagining things. Suddenly I had the sense that I shouldn't be here. Perhaps it was that the wind picked up and the rattling of the high windows grew violent. Maybe it was just the general vibe of nobody being around. My familiar library felt like a stranger. There was no sign of the librarian, and I don't know how long he'd be. So I dropped the comic on the desk and left. All I wanted was to get home and out of sight, even if nobody was around to see me. That night, I dreamed that I was playing Wizard Quest in bed. My flat is small, and the bed folds down over the couch. The television is on the wall facing the couch by day, and bed by night. I had the lights off in the dream, though there was a faint orange glow around the TV. When I woke up later, I realized the setup made no sense. Wizard Quest is a PC game and I did not have my computer hooked up to the TV, and I definitely hadn't gone to the trouble of setting the game up with my controller. In the dream, I didn't question it. I was running around in Wizard Quest with no particular direction to what I was doing. When I think about it now, I remember flashes of images. Running around the village in the forest, following a stone road in an unfamiliar grey valley or just going in circles inside a barely lit castle. Then the wall shuddered with a monumental banging. In the dream I understood it to be the neighbors, angry at the noise the game was making. As I write this now, I recall that the level of force was unnaturally heavy, violent, almost threatening. Dream Peter was terrified. I'm sorry. I said in a voice that was practically crying. I think at that point I either switched off the game or the dream switched focus because I don't remember anything else that happened afterwards. For the rest of the weekend I tried to forget about silly things that I'd probably misunderstood. As though such a mundane conversation would be magically foretold to some layabout like me. Did I honestly think that I was a psychic? And why would a mysterious force communicate to me through a player ticket? On the following Monday, I went into work ready to check Rastanafly's ticket and see that the chat was nothing like what I remembered. Of course the words wouldn't match what I heard at the library. There was zero chance that she'd reference the book Losing My Sins. And yet there it all was. I pulled up the ticket in the database and reviewed the chat logs and it was all exactly as I remembered and overheard. I felt sick. It seemed so unimportant, but at the same time it was breaking a fundamental rule of the universe. There was nothing. I could tell anybody else either. They'd laugh if I told them a customer had spewed out a record of an incidental library conversation a day in advance. I knew I'd have reacted that way if anyone had ever come to me with that story. Over and over, I thought. Why me? Why that conversation? When I checked Rastanafly's ticket history, there was just one other contact where she'd asked for an item to be restored. The chat had already been ordinary and dull. A simple question-slash-answer with no cryptic messages or references. 
Her listed address was somewhere far to the north, so... Unless she'd been on a random weekend trip to my dismal little town, she probably wasn't the person I'd seen at the library, right? Another thought occurred to me, and I checked my surveys to see if she'd filled one in for me. Apparently she had, and I almost felt better when I saw that she'd given me no stars. My indignation, briefly pushing away the nameless dread building inside me. She'd left a comment, too. Didn't even try to help. I thought that was unfair. It wasn't my fault she'd ignored my questions and gone offline. After work, the library was on my mind again. Though I was doing my best to ignore any thoughts of weird, predicted conversations. It was nevertheless there in the back of my mind. I should find that comic again, and read it properly this time. I thought to myself as I took the backstreet shortcut to the library. Besides, it was actually sunny for once. The world felt brighter, more optimistic. It was almost enough to dispel that alien sensation I'd felt when I had last been in the library, surrounded by the clattering of window frames overhead. When I reached the library, though, it was shut. There was no explanation given for why, and nobody around to ask. As the bad feeling threatened to return in full, I quickly dispelled it by telling myself I'd go to one of the bookshops in town and buy the first few volumes of that series instead. Some retail therapy would keep the demons at bay, I figured. I didn't read much of those comics though. As soon as I got home, I found myself on the internet looking up any information about the library closure. But there was nothing conclusive. The best I found was a post asking why it was shut, and the library account replying that, on foreseen circumstances, meant that it would be closed temporarily. Had I missed something significant about that conversation? What if the librarian had murdered that woman when he'd led her into the back area? What if she'd murdered him? But there would have been some sort of news if that had happened, right? Maybe they'd both disappeared back there. Perhaps they'd eloped and left nobody to run the library. It didn't have to be the worst case scenario after all. My mind flooded with possibilities, but again and again I kept coming back to the notion that they'd disappeared or been murdered. I doubted that it was anything to do with being psychic, regardless of being witness to a foretold conversation. It was just that I gravitated towards the pessimistic outcome in most cases. I don't know the library's name to look him up, and he wasn't listed on the vague info available online. There was just a bland email to contact, or a phone number. I pondered giving it a call, but what was I going to say? I wasn't a detective. I couldn't just call up a library and ask if the librarian had disappeared or been murdered. What if he was the one to answer anyway? What would I say? Would I ask him about the woman in green who'd been looking for losing my sins? Thinking about it now, I probably could have done something like that. Maybe if I hadn't been quietly freaking out, losing my head over the possibility that I'd received some sort of cosmic warning and completely ignored it. It was easier to just find a distraction for the rest of the evening, but I decided not to go with Wizard Quest. The next day, I barely slept, and my ticket answering suffered accordingly. If people needed the extra mile, I couldn't even grant them another foot. The term, benefit of the doubt, was an alien concept that never landed on my planet. If people didn't answer my questions first time, I politely wished them a good day and closed the ticket. It was almost like I knew that something bad was coming again. Everything felt vivid and intense, like the unnatural light before a thunderstorm. And then it happened again. The next ticket in my queue just read, Hello, like before. This time the customer was called Redforth. I rolled off my usual opening message feeling certain of what was about to happen, even if I didn't know the specifics. C.S. Pete. Hello, this is C.S. Pete, contacting you in regard to the ticket you sent. What did you need assistance with? Redforth. Hello, this shouldn't take more than a minute. Hoping that this wasn't going to be like Rastanafly's conversation, I tried to keep things light. C.S. Pete. 
That's good to hear. How can I help you? Red forth. Okay, come on in. My stomach dropped. His reply didn't fully make sense in context like with Rastanafly, but I was just jumping to conclusions, right? CSP. So, what do you need? Red forth. Thank you. Have you lived here long? CSP. <laughs> A few years. So, did you need me to help with something? Red forth. Wait. And then, like Rastanafly, he went offline. There must have been something off about my expression, as Toby, sitting at the desk next to me, suddenly leaned over. Hey, you okay? You don't look so good. It took me a second to reconnect with the world. I jerked my head around to look at him. Oh, it's nothing. I just slept badly. I think... I'm fine. There's nothing wrong. He gave me a skeptical frown. You might want to take a break for a few. It wasn't a player giving you crap, was it? No, not at all. You don't need to worry about me. So here I am now, trying to figure all of this out. I still haven't found out anything about the library, or the woman in green, or even the book, Losing My Sins. Maybe she got the name slightly wrong, but the only book I found with a similar name didn't seem like something important enough that the universe would break the time-space continuum to contact some random CS rep. But I am strongly wondering if these aren't some sort of warning. Maybe I didn't step into something bad on Saturday. Possibly this new conversation is my chance to make a real difference. I don't know what you guys might think, I've put this together in a bit of a rush, and I'm going to post it all now, and maybe come back to it later if I run into anything new. My plan is to listen out for that conversation, and see if I can't change things around this time. For now, though, I've got a flat inspection. I'm going to have to scoot. Catch you on the other side. I've never been much for excitement. I'm the sort who likes to get invited out, but always volunteers to be the designated driver. Relieved because it means I get to stay sober and serious. No one expects the DD to go dancing on tables or telling wild stories. I can be a shy, reserved, plain Jane. I keep my nose in books and out of everyone else's business. That was why it surprised everyone. Especially me. When I agreed to join Miki and Shania in urban exploring that day. Miki is my cousin, and Shania is her best friend. I guess I agreed to go because I was feeling a bit stung over the fact that my crush, Yasmin, who is gorgeous and has a voice that could call angels, commented to friends that I am a bit boring. And so I guess I just wanted to not be boring. To have, for once, a story worthy of telling over a drink. But when we got to the house, I felt uneasy. The whole neighborhood was sad, really. A story of American prosperity turned to poverty and abandonment. Entire streets with only one or two houses still occupied. And the rest withering away with boarded windows in overgrown lots. Miki picked out the house at random, saying it looked creepy. I don't know if it was any creepier than any other sad building in that cul-de-sac. The house had yellow siding stained by weather and time. Curtains hanging in the cracked upstairs windows. A short flight of stairs leading to the front door. The lower windows were all boarded, and the door, of course, locked. But while I was ready to give up almost immediately, Shania's eyes sparkled at the challenge. She circled around to the back of the house, and a triumphant yell brought Miki and me following. The back door, though boarded, had been broken into at some point over the years, and it swung open easily. Are we sure it's safe? I wondered. Shania just grinned. You gonna stay here if it's not? She asked and plunged into the darkness. And that's how it was inside dark. 
Shania and Miki flickered on headlamps and flashlights. I only had my phone light, so Shania pulled out a spare flashlight from her backpack for me. Girl, it's just an empty house with old stuff. She squeezed my arm in encouragement. Nothing to be scared of, unless you believe in ghosts. And she winked and laughed. A bold peal of laughter that lifted my spirits and made me jealous all at the same time. I didn't know a person could laugh in the face of fear like that. I didn't really believe in ghosts. I didn't believe, but was still scared of them. Was that pathetic? I smiled weakly and thanked her for the flashlight. Miki told me to quit being a baby and squeezed in past me. And all three of us entered the living room and looked around. It looked exactly like every old person's living room. The carpeted floor was a dark beige and stained with coffee here and there. A plush armchair sat facing an ancient television. The kind that looks like a boxy cube, not a modern flat screen. I almost expected to see antenna sitting on top of the old thing. Bookshelves and hutches held books, knickknacks, cups and glasses and many years worth of dust. Little ceramic figurines of children and pigs with wings and big-eyed frogs and all sorts of odds and ends looked out at us. It was cluttered and a lot of it was broken. The wallpaper peeling and mold streaking the walls. Just a forgotten, lonely old house. Dang! Shania picked up a figurine from one of the shelves. Look at this stuff. Super vintage. But there's, like, collectibles and stuff we could take. You want to bring some back? Suggested Miki. I wondered aloud if that counted as stealing. Both girls looked at me, and I shut my mouth. Shania looked around, gesturing with her flashlight, and said, Stealing from who? She had a point. I couldn't really argue. Still, I don't know. Just feels kind of disrespectful. I mumbled. More disrespectful than leaving it all here to rot? Shania tucked a glass-eyed frog into her pocket. At least if we take some, someone's getting use out of them. Miki took out a bag and began filling it with some of the bowls and candle holders she thought might be crystal. I was pretty sure they were just glass, though. Shania was more interested in the figurines. I looked around, unsure what to take, and finally, my flashlight illuminated a ceramic lovebird sculpture. I don't know why I was drawn to it. It seemed handmade. The glaze wasn't perfect, and the wings were a little clumsy. I imagined it might have been a gift, not store-bought. Somehow the idea of a handmade gift, passed down and forgotten and then recovered, moved me. So I wrapped it up in some napkins and put it in my bag. I was still looking at the shelves, moving into the kitchen with its dirty and torn linoleum, when a scream made me jump. Back in the living room? Toward the rear of the house. Miki was shining her flashlight on something. Shania with her, both of them whispering. Then Shania bent toward the floor. Approaching, I saw that they were looking at the staircase leading up to the second floor bedrooms. The thought of going up there filled me with dread, and my gut bunched with knots. But my entire stomach seemed to overturn itself when I saw what Shania's light was shining on. A dark stain just below the bottom steps. A person-shaped stain. There was the head, there were two arms... Okay... That's... really freaky... said Miki. Shania, kneeling and grim-faced, was tracing her flashlight along the outline. You know what happens sometimes with old folks. They die, and no one finds them for a while. The body just lies there, decomposing. This is probably where she died. She? I echoed. Or he, but all these figurines and stuff make me think grandma, not gramps. But if we go upstairs, we'll find floral dresses hanging in the closets. I'm not going upstairs, I announced. 
Me either, declared Miki. Shania wanted to go. Carefully avoiding stepping on the body stain, she ascended the stairs. From up there, she called out to us about things she found. Bathroom is a mess. Yuck. Yep, lots of flower print. Stuff like that. Finally, she returned, a dusty frame in hand, and offered it to Miki. It was a photograph of an elderly woman and a woman and a boy. Bet that's the old woman who lived here. And her family. I wonder why they didn't check on her when she fell down the stairs, said Miki. Who knows? Maybe they're dead too. Maybe they live out of state, Shania shrugged. Look at this neighborhood. Been emptied out a long time ago. Chances are wherever her family lives, it's not close by. Come on, let's get out of here. Thought I heard something up there. Heard something? The hairs on my neck prickled. Like what? Like her ghost. Gonna yell at us for stealing. Said Miki and laughed. Then she and Shania raced to see who could get out first. Pushing me aside. I cried out, nearly falling on that stain. I almost touched it. Guys, wait! I yelled, running after them. Halfway out of the room, I'd swear I heard a sound. A voice calling to me, and I screamed, heart hammering, my voice ripping from my lungs in a shriek of utter terror as I rushed after the others and out to the car. They wouldn't stop teasing me the whole drive back. Your scream could have woken the dead, Shania exclaimed. Seriously, I thought something got you. Put in Miki. I didn't tell them how I thought I heard an old woman's voice. They'd just laugh harder at me. Miki dropped me off back home, and Shania told me she hoped I had fun and wasn't scared too much. I smiled weakly and waved goodbye, and retreated up to my bedroom in my parents' house. I'm saving for enough to move out, but for now, I pay a small amount of rent while I work at my uncle's shop running the register. I felt ready to cocoon myself for a good week. This would make a good story to tell when I joined everyone for drinks. But it'd be a while before I'd be up for it. I put the ceramic birds on the windowsill, trying to decide if they were cute or just creepy. A shower took off the last of the grime and the chills, and by dinner time, I was feeling excited enough to share what I'd done with my friends snapped a pic of the birds and texted to the group chat with Yasmin and the others, explaining that I'd found the birds in an abandoned house and even seen the body stain where the old woman who owned them died. Lots of exclamations and emojis from everyone in response. Yasmin texted, Whoa, dang girl, you gotta invite me next time. I hadn't been planning a next time. The thought of exploring more terrifying places made my pulse escalate, and not in a good, fluttery way. But if it impressed Yasmin, if it made me more interesting and less boring... Anyway, I tucked my phone away and went to bed feeling, for once, like someone who had stories to tell. Not the dull girl who looked after the shop and was so forgettably plain. The only name she could possibly have was Jane. No, I'd become someone else. Brave. Exciting. I had glorious dreams of dancing on tables at the center of parties, but something jolted me awake in the dead of night. I lay there, curled under my sheets, every hair on end. From somewhere downstairs came a soft wail. A moan. Ah, the old woman. The moaning continued. I pulled the pillow over my head and whimpered, too terrified to move. How did her wailing not wake anybody else? She was so loud. I don't know how long I lay there, wishing the wailing would stop before I drifted off to sleep again. When I woke, sunlight streamed through my window. My recollection of the previous night was hazy. I assumed the wailing must have been a dream. I even laughed at myself. Here I was, 
plain Jane giving myself nightmares because I was such a homebody that the slightest adventure had me spooked. I headed downstairs for breakfast and froze. On the wooden floorboards at the bottom of the stairs was a stain. The same stain we'd seen in the empty house. Mom? I shrilled. My mom rushed out of the kitchen. Jane, what is it? I pointed to the floor of the stairs, right where she was standing. Mom looked down, stepped back accidentally trampling the stain as she examined the floor and then looked back up at me, questioning. What? Honey, what is it? The stain. I whimpered. Stain? She echoed. Dropped down to her knees, peering close. Where? She couldn't see it. She was right on it and couldn't see it. Um, never mind. I said. Hurrying back to my room, I snatched my phone, came back and took a picture of the stain to send to Miki and Shania. Except, it didn't show up. I could see it on the floor, see it right there with my own eyes. But when I tried snapping a pic with my phone, nothing on the screen. Sweetie? Mom's brow knit in concern. Everything alright? Um, yeah. Yeah, just... yeah. I smiled feebly. Having lost my appetite, I went to work without breakfast. After my shift when I came home, the stain was still there. If anything, darker than before. But mom and dad went up and down the stairs without seeing it. I went upstairs and got the birds. Considered shattering them and scattering the pieces. But as I held up the little ceramic sculpture ready to drop it on my floor, pangs of guilt had me setting it carefully back down. I should return it to the house, I thought. Until then, I wrapped it up and tucked it deep into my closet, out of sight, out of mind. Hopefully once it was back in its place, the stain would disappear. The moans persisted every night. Always around the same time, the stain persisted as well. As for Miki and Shania, they refused to take me back to the house to return the birds. They didn't want to go back, and didn't believe me about any of it. Especially after Miki came to my parents' home and couldn't see the stain. She asked if I was just making it up for attention. I'd have been angry, furious at my cousin for throwing such an accusation in my face if I hadn't been so terrified in that moment because just behind her stood an old woman. Things got worse. The old woman appeared randomly in my house, always near the stairs. Sometimes I'd hear her come out of her room. Sometimes she'd be hovering by the window, looking confused. Other times she was looking right at me. One night I arrived home after midnight I'd been out with friends doing my usual shift as the DD. No one really noticed how morose I was. My thoughts that night were on Yasmin and my social situation and wondering if I would ever break out of my own shell. When as I headed upstairs, a cold and clammy hand gripped my ankle. Shrieking, I ripped free. My shrill scream woke my mom and dad who rushed out. Dad with his fists up ready to fight whatever intruder was apparently murdering his daughter. I rushed into my room and slammed the door, sobbing. When I came out, there was no one there. Nothing. Just my parents looking at me, concerned. They asked me if I'd be willing to see a psychiatrist. I thought maybe a medium would be better. And I found one online who did a teleconference with me. She recommended the same thing my instinct had told me to do initially. Destroy the ceramic birds. I'd taken a personal item, she said. Something that meant something to the deceased. If this object was what had brought the ghost into my home, destroying it would free me. Next day when I returned from work, I retrieved the birds from upstairs. I decided that, rather than destroy them, which seemed disrespectful, 
I'd start by returning them to the house where I found them, even if it meant I had to go back there alone. But I'd just left my room and barely reached the bottom of the steps when... Cold fingers clasped my ankle. I shrieked, jerking free and rushing to the door. The ghost trying to grab me. As I reached the front door, I spun back, glaring over my shoulder. I could see her now. The ghost of the old woman. She lay at the bottom of the steps, her fingers curled into claws and her face a grimacing snarl. Her mouth opened in a wail. I stood there for a long time staring, and then I came back over to the stairs. And when I knelt down, she grabbed my arm so tight. Her icy hand left strange imprints on my skin. I held the birds down to her and with my other hand clasped hers. I don't know what gave me the courage to suddenly do this, but now I heard what it was she'd been wailing over and over again. Help, she groaned. I'm here, I said. Her hand squeezed tighter. I'm sorry I ran away before. I don't know who gave you these birds, but they must have loved you very much. I'm sure they wished they could have been there for you. She was listening now, her mouth still a grimace of pain. I'm not religious and I don't know any prayers, so I just kept saying, I'm here. You're not alone. Here are the birds. Here's my hand. I don't really know what else I said. My vision was blurry and I didn't realize that tears were streaming down my cheeks until I blinked and squeezed my eyes shut and reached up to wipe them clear. And when I looked down again, the old woman was gone. I was alone. Just me sitting there at the bottom of the steps with some dusty ceramic birds in my palm. The stain was gone. The medium told me I should get rid of the birds anyway. But I didn't. I went upstairs and put them back on my window sill. They sit there still. I'm keeping them for someone who shouldn't have been forgotten. The morning I woke up to find my girlfriend Ava was gone was like a splash of cold water to the face. At first, I thought she had left for an early shift at her job at the diner in downtown Eldridge. A sleepy little town that rarely saw anything more exciting than the annual fall fair. My phone was dead, which was odd because I could have sworn I plugged it in the night before. After rummaging through the drawers for a charger and giving it some juice, the date flashing on the screen made my heart stop. February 17th, 2024. That couldn't be right. Last night was February 16th, 2023. I stumbled out of bed, my heart racing as I dialed Ava's number, only to be greeted by the cold, impersonal tone of a disconnected line. The streets were just as confused and silent as I felt. Neighbors milled around, some in tears, others with a dazed look I probably mirrored. It wasn't just Ava, others were missing too. We're doing everything we can. The sheriff assured everyone at the press conference, his eyes hollow, reflecting a year of question with no answers. The police investigation stirred up more confusion than clarity. The only common thread was the last thing anyone could recall, a thick, unnerving fog that had swallowed the whole town. Hours turned into days, and with each passing moment, the weight of our collective amnesia pressed heavier. Then the vision started. At first I thought they were nightmares, fragments of a subconscious trying to make sense of the nonsensical. But when I overheard Mrs. Henderson at the grocery store, whispering about the shadows she'd seen in her dreams, I realized these weren't just personal demons. Others were all seeing them as well. In the days that followed, a makeshift support group formed. We were a band of the bereaved, each of us missing a piece of our lives, desperately searching for answers in a town that had none to give. 
We met in the back room of Eldridge's library, a space generally offered by the librarian Sarah, who was missing her husband and children. The meetings began as a way to share information, any leads that the police might have overlooked, but they quickly devolved into something much darker. It was during one of these gatherings, under the sterile buzz of fluorescent lights, that we first spoke of the visions. As the meetings unfolded, a shared narrative began to emerge, pieced together from the fragments of those gathered in the dimly lit back room. It was a story that seemed too bizarre, too otherworldly to be anything but the collective imaginings of a town gripped by loss and confusion. Yet the details were too consistent, too vivid to dismiss outright. Every account converged on a single scene, a clearing in the woods, enveloped in a fog so dense it felt alive, almost sentient. None of us remembered how we got there, yet the place was eerily familiar, as if it had always been a part of the town's landscape, hidden in plain sight, and at the center of the clearing stood a large stone altar, ancient and worn, its origins lost to time. The memories were fragmented, like shards of glass reflecting pieces of a whole we couldn't quite grasp. But, as we shared, the picture became clearer, and a chilling realization settled over us. We had all been there, standing in a circle around the altar, our hands joined in a pact we could scarcely comprehend. As the conversation spiraled deeper into the shared darkness of our memories, I found myself speaking without thought, my voice a stranger to my own ears. It was the only way, I heard myself say. The only way the fog would let the town go. The room fell into a hushed silence, the weight of my words hanging heavy in the air. Then from the back, the voice of my neighbor Tom cut through the quiet. Can you still taste them? Those five words were like a key turning in a lock I didn't know existed. A floodgate of memories opened and with it came a rush of visceral, undeniable truth. I was back there, in the clearing, the fog caressing my skin with cold fingers, and there in my hands was flesh, cooked human flesh. The horror of the realization was paralyzing, but even as my mind recoiled, my senses betrayed me. The taste, the texture, it was all there, horrifyingly vivid, as if watching through someone else's eyes I saw myself take a bite, the act so barbaric yet so achingly familiar. And then I saw it, the remnants of a tattoo on the charred skin. The revelation hit me like a truck, sending me spiraling into a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. The words, Ava loves Hunter inked on the charred forearm were unmistakable. My stomach revolted as I hunched over, the contents of my gut splattering onto the cold library floor. The world didn't just spin, it capsized, plunging me into a dark sea of guilt and disbelief. As I tried to catch my breath, grasping for air that suddenly felt too thick to breathe, Sarah's screams tore through the eerie silence of the library. Her cries, raw and filled with an agony that words couldn't possibly capture, echoed off the walls. She collapses into a heap on the floor, her body racked with sobs that seemed to shake the very foundation of the room. I ate them. My god. I ate my children. The past year had me riddled with anxiety, and only until recently did I find the dread-filled pit in my stomach become quenched by relief. It's a strangely blissful feeling, 
The feeling that one's little secret will remain that way until death. I'll be upfront about it. There's no point beating around the bush. I murdered my husband just over a year ago. We'd been hiking when a quarrel led to something more spiteful, more vicious. It was raining heavily and, as we'd neared the small cliff, wherein I had judged that a fall from it would certainly not kill anyone, I had pushed him. Yet, what I had failed to calculate was that he'd fall and hit his head on a rather sharp rock, killing him instantly. I was so frightened. I leapt down immediately, noticing how much blood had pooled beneath his crushed skull, splashing upwards at me with each pulsing raindrop that fell onto him, onto us. Like the blood was trying and failing to splatter back at me in retaliation for what I'd done. To mark me externally, in the same manner that guilt and fear had done internally. I did what any normal person would have done, and called the police and ambulance services, explaining everything that had happened, bar a few crucial details. That my poor dear husband had slipped from the torrential rain and lost his footing, tumbling backwards to his demise. It wasn't hard for the police to believe my tale, with no previous mentions of abuse, verbal or physical. They quickly accepted my story as fact, and the gushing words from my in-laws and his friends cemented it on the official report. It's funny, isn't it? The way that pervasive guilt makes crocodile tears flow with ease. It wasn't an unwelcome sight. To see a bereaved spouse crying a fountain at their love's funeral. That's the point of marriage. Till death do us part. But no one ever expects it to happen so soon. So early in the binding contract. We'd only been married for two years before I murdered him and had been high school sweethearts long before that. The sympathetic hugs and pats that wrapped around condolences allowed me to crumble more, to feign pain in a frantically authentic way. The performance of a lifetime, till death do us part, and in death, he had parted from me, and the role of victim had been unceremoniously reversed. I was the victim now. The victim of purely unfortunate circumstances. The thing is, though, is that guilt is an incredibly difficult emotion to shake off. It wraps around you like shackled binds, covering your mouth and ears in a thick smoke that clouds your perceptions. And, as guilt takes its hold on you, it provides more leeway for its lover to sink its icy claws into your back as well. Paranoia. Following the funeral, paranoia engulfed me, followed me everywhere I went. Which was mostly just from the bedroom into the kitchen. I was terrified of being caught out in a lie. At any moment a policeman would come knocking at my door having found the slightest beacon of truth cracked through the fabricated story. I had considered turning myself in many a time, but with each day that passed of me withholding information, the greater the consequences of my actions. Technically, what I'd done was more akin to manslaughter than murder. I hadn't planned on murdering him whatsoever, just spooking him a bit. I hadn't premeditated it either. What I feared more, however, was that the care and sympathy that etched my loved one's faces throughout the whole ordeal would be replaced with disgust, horror, and anger, substituting pity. I'll admit that I liked it a lot. The feeling of being cared for so much, like I was a mere baby cradled by words of assurance and love, little encouragements that made my life so much easier. It was a free pass from any mistakes. Work became less heavy, and permission to engage in alcoholic indulgences, more often than was healthy, was also prevalent. It was a high I'd never felt before. The feeling of being excused from the mundane normalcy that everyone else had to trudge through. I suppose you could call it something akin to Mancosin syndrome. 
Without the need to actively self-induce illness to garner the attention I so desperately needed, my dead husband had done that all for me. I was finally free from the shackles of societal expectations, and slowly but surely, I was able to overwhelm the guilt and paranoia that had once overwhelmed me. I had won, and gained nothing but the benefits of it all. That was until a week ago. Sitting on my sofa, while languidly sipping red wine, the lock to my door began to jostle, as if someone had a key to unlock it. My mind went straight to my mother-in-law, who had a spare set made in order for her to come and hand me a freshly made casserole. She'd done nothing but coddle me since her son's death, and I had to quickly hide my gleeful grin with a more sorrowful expression. Standing up and hiding my drink, I walked into the hallway to greet her, except it wasn't her. It was my husband. I shrieked in fear, the feeling of bile threatening to unleash blood-red spew from my mouth. He was there, in his suit smiling at me with blinding teeth that could have melted the hearts of any spouse desperately wanting to be reunited with their other half. Could've, should've, but for me, I felt nothing but abject horror. Oops, sorry honey, didn't mean to frighten you. He smiled sympathetically as he took off his suit jacket and hung it on the coat rack. He waltzed towards my rigid frame and enveloped me in a strong hug. He was warm and his breath hot. He was real. His flesh wasn't that of a reanimated corpse. He was alive. My ear that was pressed against his chest could hear the low thumping of his heart pumping blood. I could barely speak. I pushed away and ran to the bathroom, hurling muddied and reddish vomit into the porcelain basin. He shot in behind me holding my hair up as to not get it sodden. Oh god, honey, are you alright? He asked, love and care dripping from his words. I simply continued to vomit. Shall I get you some water? He'd asked, and before I could respond, he'd already gone and fetched a glass. He held it to my lips, and the cold fluid cooled the acidic burn in my throat. How... how are you? I'd finally managed to mutter out. My tone croaked. I know, I know, he sweetened, rubbing soft circles on the small of my back. I was swamped at work today, but at least I'm getting paid overtime. Boss said I'm due for a promotion soon. I was thinking maybe we could go on a nice weekend getaway, or... I'd interrupted him. You're dead. You... you died, and I... I felt my breath grow louder, raspier, and I knew a panic attack was fast approaching. The clamminess in my hands and on my temples told me just as much. Oh, did you have a nightmare? It's okay. He started picking me up from the bathroom floor and ushering me back into the living room, settling me down on the sofa whilst whispering sweet nothings in my ear. I never would have thought that such honey-ridden words would bring such wasp-like stings to my psyche. It's just a nightmare, sweetheart. I'm here now. It's alright. I don't think we stayed up for much longer after that. I silently tiptoed around him, nervously trying to gauge if I was having some intense hallucination that my paranoia hadn't really left and was punishing me for being so complacent in the past few months. I remember being unable to sleep that first night, his shallow breathing jerking me back to reality. I'd wriggled out of his grasp when he slept, as though his warm touch scolded me with each lingering moment. The next morning he disappeared, and for a moment I'd felt relief. Relief that maybe I wasn't insane, yet the indent of his pillow brought me back into a state of shock and told me that I wasn't truly absolved of his presence. He was downstairs in the kitchen making breakfast. 
the humming that left his lips swirling into the music that emanated from the radio. Pancakes? I thought you might need them this morning. He beamed, his shirtless, muscular frame hidden only by an apron adorned with flour. To any other love-struck wife, this would be a dream, a perfect achievement that life was bliss. To me, it was unfurling rapidly into a nightmare. Did he know? Did he remember what I'd done? Had I dreamt the whole past year up? Had I been stuck in a sick fantasy that made me crave his disappearance? I'm not hungry, I stated, more spitefully than I'd intended. Like a wounded puppy, he frowned before rushing over and placing the meat of his palm against my forehead. It was still warm, still real. Are you still sick from yesterday? He worried, and it took every muscle in my body to prevent myself from slapping his hand away. Finally, he released me. You don't look very well. I mean, you look fantastic, as you always do. Just a tad under the weather. He kissed my cheek, and the wetness from his lips sent iced shivers down my spine. Shall I call your work? Tell them you don't feel well? He asked, and I nodded rigidly. He smiled warmly once more. Okay, you go off to bed. I don't want you dying on me. I remember how gut-wrenching that last sentence was. For a moment, I thought I saw a darkly humorous gleam in his eyes, like he'd caught me in a trap, like he was toying with me. I turned on my heel and ran back up the stairs, slamming the bedroom door behind me. I remember how I paced around the room, biting at the skin around my nails until they became sore and pink. A knock on the bedroom door made me shoot into the bed pulling the covers over my head and pretending to be fast asleep. He'd come in, and the weight beside me on the bed told me he was close, and growing ever closer to my exposed ear. Honey? He inquired, in that sickly sweet voice that I'd long since forgotten until the past few hours. A finger brushed the hair by my ear, lovingly I assumed, but... All I'd felt was lingering torment. He must have thought I'd truly managed to fall asleep that quickly. A dark chuckle left his lips before excited squeals racked his chest. Like a child who'd been allowed an ice cream for behaving well, I was so focused on keeping my body still. On the thudding of my heart that I hadn't realized his mouth being mere inches from my ear. Till death do us part. Then he'd left. I waited there for what must have been an hour, frozen in place. He did know. He knew exactly what I had done, and he was toying with me. This was my judgment day. After I'd decided enough time had passed, I gingerly left my bedroom, tiptoeing around and noticing that his car had gone. The kitchen was spotless, so he must have cleaned up. My perfect, undead husband had left for work. I went on Facebook, no messages left with condolences from his friends. In fact, the entire post I'd made about the passing of the love of my life had completely disappeared without a trace. All the photos of family events that had me looking solemn and shy were now replaced with almost exact replicas except for the smiling face of my dead husband peering at the camera next to me, his large hand clamped around my waist or shoulder, as if he'd never died. I couldn't stand it. Everything I'd gained, everything I'd worked so hard for, was so cruelly ripped up from me. It was like I'd died. I was no longer the poor, grief-stricken wife. I was the happiest and luckiest woman in the world. It destroyed me from the inside out. I needed it. The sympathy, the victimhood. I craved it stronger than ever before. This must be what opioid addicts feel like when the euphoria is so suddenly stripped from them. The cold shaking of my fingertips felt just as much like withdrawals. So, 
I decided to kill my husband again. This time make sure he was really never going to come back. Never ruin my life again. I went out for a drive and bought some sleeping pills. Lots. Just over the counter stuff, but strong ones nonetheless. A few bottles. On being his favorite wine, and a couple of steaks to make his favorite meal. I'm not that much of a villain, you know? I'm kind enough to at least send him out with his one last hurrah. I slaved away in the kitchen, making sure that the steak dinner was piping hot and ready to be consumed once he'd walked through the door. I'd even lit some candles as well, and dressed up nicely, putting on makeup in the exact way he liked it. I practiced in the mirror, the bashful looks and fluttering of lashes that were just coy enough to give him the implication that I was going to give him, my dear husband, everything he deserved. He'd arrived home and picked me up with glee at the sight of what I had prepared, swinging me around and peppering kisses all over my neck. The girlish giggles I'd forced out of my chest were truly convincing if I do say so myself, and we sat down in the living room, ready to eat. I hope you like it. I said softly, a million dollar smile stretched over my face. How could I not? This is perfect. You are perfect. He lovingly gushed, cutting a piece of meat and placing it in his mouth. He moaned in pleasure. Simply divine. You really should become a chef. Write a cookbook. I giggled once again, ignoring the nagging disdain that threatened to furrow his brow. Oh, I forgot. I said, clasping my hands together in the most adorable way I could muster. Would you like a glass of wine? I bought your favorite. It seemed impossible that his grin could grow any wider, but it did. Wow, yeah, please. With that, I sauntered off to the kitchen, swaying my hips seductively as I left. Men are such fickle creatures, and hopefully any remaining doubts in his mind would soon be overridden with lustful thoughts. From the living room, I could hear him muttering to himself, words along the lines of, What did I do to deserve her? and the like. I was ever so fortunate that my husband was a white wine drinker, and me a red, so bringing in two distinct glasses would be no alarm to him. I'd already opened the bottle, hours before he'd arrived, filling the bottle with packet after packet of crushed sleeping pills, which had allowed enough time for them to fully dissolve into the pale liquid. I emerged back into the living room, placing his glass of wine in front of him whilst taking a sip from my own, and kissed him on his cheek. A small blush arose from him, and he gleamed with mirth. We continued to chat over dinner. A few seductive glances passed between us before he swayed slightly and fell asleep in his chair. I checked his pulse. It was still there. Slowly, his body crumpled onto the floor, the deep slumber rendering his muscles useless. Here was the tricky part. I could have left him there, to inevitably choke on his own tongue or vomit, which wasn't entirely out of the question, seeing as I'd put enough sleeping pills in the wine to kill a horse. But seeing his strong frame lay on the ground made me question if it was enough to kill him. If he'd survived, that would mean the money I'd wasted on this whole ordeal was worthless, not to mention another day of agonizing withdrawals from the ultimate pleasure of being pitied. So I changed out of my outfit and put on plain black clothing, with the washing up gloves on for good measure. Luckily, I still had a stash of COVID masks left over from the pandemic. And after placing one over my mouth and nose, along with a shower cap to prevent any hair from falling onto him, I got a hammer out of my husband's toolbox and stood over him. I had a few practice takes, swinging the hammer in the air to see what method would cause the most damage. Then I got to work. I felt bad for him, of course, 
sleeping there blissfully like a baby, but like any addict, I would do anything to get my fix. So I smashed his skull until his entire forehead caved in. It surprised me how little force was needed to really get in there. Near his brains. It was child's play, and rather therapeutic. With each splatter and squelch, I felt the weight of the world lift from my shoulders. And though I hate to admit it, because I'm not really a psychopathic maniac, it was so unimaginably pleasurable. I was no longer forcing the giggles out. They racked my body uncontrollably. I cleaned up, satisfied with my work, and dragged his body into the bathroom and placed him into the bath allowing the shower head to help bleed him out. I checked Facebook once more, and everything was back to normal. The family photos, the post I'd made about his demise, and the messages from his friends were all back to the way they were. The way they should be. That night I slept so soundly, knowing that my once again dead husband was in the bathroom downstairs. But the next morning he was there in bed with me again. The feeling of his chest against my back, his arms wrapped around my body. Warm, alive, just like nothing had happened. I sobbed so much. Once again the desperate relief I desired was ripped so cruelly from my grasp. Venom laced my veins and I turned to look at him, his eyes blinking from waking up. Morning. He smiled, kissing my forehead. I squirmed. What's wrong? I shot up out of bed, grasping for breath. How could he do this to me? How could he claim he loved me when he denied me such needed pleasures? Oh dear, are you upset about last night? He questioned, his eyes holding that taunting glint in them once again. I refrained from answering. I really didn't appreciate that, you know, to think you'd be so naive to try and get rid of me again. He chuckled before getting out of bed to approach me. It doesn't matter, though. I don't mind. You shouldn't try it again, though. You don't know how hard I've tried to make this work. He nestled his head into the crook of my neck. He knew what he was doing, playing with me, hurting me. What do you want? I spat out, pushing him away. He wasn't startled at all. He just kept smiling sleepily at me, like I was the cutest thing on the planet. It made me sick. I just told you, I want to make this work. He repeated, scoffing like it was the most obvious thing in the world. I suppose it's time to come clean now. The argument we'd had, the first time that I'd killed him, was because I had wanted a divorce. I was feeling trapped, like I hadn't lived my life properly, fully. I'd been with my husband since I could remember, as childhood friends, to dating as teens, to married as young adults, as my friends went out to party, to have fun, to fulfill fickle desires with one night stands and toxic shags, I was working to provide for a life that I'd never known otherwise. He, of course, never wanted to leave me. That's when I'd pushed him away, to his untimely demise. Till death do us part, remember? He kissed my hand, rubbing his cheek against it lovingly. I snatched it away and slapped him with the other. He didn't seem faced at all just continued to look at me with an enamored expression until I'd left the bedroom. Throughout the past week, I murdered my husband more times than I could count. I drowned him, electrocuted him, poisoned and suffocated him. I set him alight. I beat him to death. I even stabbed him right in the neck. But every time I killed him, he came right back as loving as ever. He never fought back when I murdered him. He stared at me blissfully, even when I'd poured gasoline over his head, or lowered the hairdryer into the bath, he just sighed with slight annoyance, but shrugged it off, chuckling at my failures, my incompetency. It drove me mad, but I had noticed my thirst for pity, 
for attention from grieving family members and friends had begun to diminish. I no longer craved seeing the messages pop up on my Facebook, offering condolences and such. Instead, I craved the feeling of getting rid of them. Tonight I'd sat down and had a conversation with him, one which finally opened my eyes. He'd cuddled up to me on the sofa as we watched some terrible telenovela rerun, and I'd simply let him shower me in affection. I'd given up on trying to push him away. Why won't you die? I asked tiredly. He simply chuckled. I thought we'd been over this, sweetheart. Till death do us part. He kissed my cheek, curling his fingers in my hair. So why won't you part? You've died multiple times by now, and you still keep coming back. He sighed, shaking his head. That same sickeningly sweet smile plastered on his face, as unwavering as usual. It seems you didn't take our vows seriously. He kissed again. It's not till death I do part. It's us do part. I poured my heart and soul into those vows, which is why I'm still here. I'm here until we both go. He sighed longingly into my neck. You should count it as a blessing, really. You can hurt me all you want, and I'm still going to be right here, by your side. So, think of this as my final confession. My plea for forgiveness. Forgive me, for I have sinned. And at least I will be here no more. My husband is sleeping soundly next to me as I write this. His fingertips clasped around my waist. He has no idea that I had left his car running all night. No idea about the hose I attached to the exhaust pipe that leads into our room from the window, strapped to my mouth with tape. He has no idea that I took his words so literally, that he'd been so unaware of the lengths I'd go to squash his existence for the final time, even at the expense of my own. He's right. Till death do us part. So, it's my turn to depart. I don't really know where to start. One night, being kept up by the smashing of hail against my window, I had the idea to see what would happen if I texted my number from a phone in a lucid dream. I'm quite experienced with it. I practiced while I had nothing else to do during the pandemic. But after that idea sparked in my head, the dream I had that night had an indescribable sense of danger. As if I shouldn't, under any circumstances, have been doing what I was doing. It just felt... wrong. As I drifted off at around 3am into, well, I don't know if dream is the right word anymore. Heck, I don't know if there is a word for it. Like hell, or some sort of parallel universe we can only access when our consciousness isn't in the one we know. Anyway, apart from the weird sense of danger, it was all kind of normal. First, I played around a bit, floating through my house, using the comebacks you only think of after an argument. Then I remembered what I was there for. I picked up a phone typed in my phone number. It actually took me a few minutes because, you know, how it's pretty hard to read properly in dreams. After starting a WhatsApp conversation with myself, I texted hi and thought nothing of it. Then after I enjoyed myself some more, I woke up to my alarm. Of course, I dreaded having to go to work in the morning having not fell asleep till 3, but regardless I got up and started to get ready. I tried to connect my phone to my car's Bluetooth speaker. A rush of pure mortification made my blood run cold. As I read a text message from a random number at 5.01am saying hi. After the initial rush, 
I thought maybe I was overreacting. After all, it's a pretty generic text message. When I finished work at 4pm, I asked around if anyone knew the number, to which my answer was no. Weird, but not enough for me to think anything of it. Going back to sleep that night, I thought I'd try again out of curiosity. It felt a bit more dreadful this time, almost like I was being watched. And my once familiar home which I lived in with my family, a wife and two kids, was deserted. Paint peeling off the walls, black mold everywhere, like an abandoned house. However, being the idiot I am, I reached for my phone, typed in my phone number, and typed an indistinguishable text, 1161. This is Dream Me texting, 2812. As I put the phone down, I caught myself out of the corner of my eye. It seemed pretty tall. Humanoid, but evasive. I thought I'd best just wake up before my thoughts affected the lucid dream. I guess you could say this is when it all started. When I woke up that Saturday, I once again received a text message from the same number, reading 1161. This is Dream Me Texting 2812. I froze in shock. Have I made the next best scientific discovery ever? Or have I found a way to enter a parallel universe through dreaming? Neither. I gave them a way in. My family weren't home that morning. A deafening silence rang through the house when I put my phone down and got up to go to the bathroom. And there it was. A message in blood on the mirror. We woke up with you. But that wasn't the worst of it. I pulled back the shower curtain to reveal my wife and two kids dead, with their throats slit in the bathtub. I got in my car and drove, and that's the worst part. I've been hiding in the woods for a month now. No one has come looking. And these... things? They are nine to ten feet tall. Humanoid with extremely long arms. Razor blades for fingers. And the more I look, the more they seem to be stalking me. Let this be advice to anyone who sees this. Don't let them in.